in the right ear and the iqama in the left ear. Did you hear that one before? Who did it? MashaAllah. Anyone? No one did it besides the brother? Who's had children here? Okay, be honest. Malish, I will ruin your party soon. But until then, you know, let's see her some hands. So only a few brothers had actually called the adhan. Maybe others didn't do it because they didn't know about it. Not because they knew the reality of the situation. But here's what happened. It's a very popular practice. And it was popular for the longest time. There's a story behind it. Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyyah, rahimahullah, he has a book called Tihfat al Mawlud, Tihfat al Wadud fi Ahkam al Mawlud. Right? A, a book dealing with the newborn baby and all the rulings associated with that. Now, first, before we go to this book, there's a hadith in Sunan al Tirmidhi narrated by Abu Rafi'. So the hadith is Abu Rafi', right? And the hadith indicates that it's a sunnah to call the adhan in the right ear of the newborn baby and then call the iqama in the left. Well, they wanted the, the iqama as a separate story. Let's stick to the adhan in the right ear. Now, <coughs> that same narration in Sunan al-Tirmidhi is da'if. It is known to be da'if. However, al muqayyim had mentioned in his book that there was another reference for this hadith in the book of Shu'ab al-Iman lil-Bayhaqi. Where in that he said, Ibn Qayyim said that this narration is also da'if. There's another weak narration in Sunan al bayhaqi So pay attention because this has to do with the science of hadith. We have one weak narration in Sunan al tirmidhi one weak narration in Shu'ab al Iman lil bayhaqi Now the scholars have differed concerning the approach, but Shaykh al Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, who was a scholar of hadith, an expert in this field, he was well versed in the science of hadith, was of the opinion that when we have a number of weak narrations with various chains of narrations, this reality strengthens this hadith. Meaning, the chances for many individuals to narrate the same story through various chains is very unlikely unless this, this hadith had some basis, right? We may have some issues in the chain of narrators, but that does not, you know, exclude this hadith from being sound or acceptable. So based on his methodology, so okay, we have a hadith which is da'if in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, another one which is da'if in uh, al-Bayhaqi, Shu'ab al-Iman al-Bayhaqi. So this hadith can be acted upon due to this strengthening of the narration because of the references, and then it was allowed for the Muslims to do that. What happened, <coughs> the book, uh, book Shu'ab al-Iman was not available during that time as a book in the various bookstores. After the passage of time, finally the book was actually now with the progress of the you know the internet and so the ebooks and so on and so forth. Finally the book was became actually became available. The book became available and Shaykh al Albani rahimahullah finally had access to the book Shu'ab al Iman. When he went to that narration which was referred to by Ibn Qayyim in his book he found that in the chain of narrators, there were two individuals who were accused of being liars. Individuals who were accused by the scholars of Jarh and Ta'deel, you know, that this person, you don't take narrations from him. If you find this ex individual in the chain of narrators, this hadith is da'if because of this individual. This is a little complicated, but it may be beneficial at some point in your life, inshallah. The point being, the hadith is da'if, jiddan, very weak. And the methodology of the Shaykh was, you do not strengthen a weak narration with a very weak narration. So when he finally realized that Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, had given the wrong ruling by calling it da'if, whereas it should have been da'if jiddan, he realized that this hadith now cannot hold any water. Consequently, this hadith is inauthentic. Consequently, you cannot act upon it anymore. No more calling the adhan in the, in the right ear. Now, if you did it, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Deeds are according to intentions. If you intended to follow the sunnah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not deprive you of the reward. However, now that you know, and if you don't have any knowledge of hadith, you cannot oppose the shaykh unless you have knowledge of hadith, so you may oppose this methodology, then we can no longer act upon this issue. So this, this hadith, this ruling, or this aspect of Islam becomes 
doubtful. Because we are not sure of the authenticity, we have uncertainty concerning the authenticity of the evidence which we are using. So it was doubtful, now it is clear for those who follow that methodology. The second example is the applicability of the evidence for a given case. Does this, does this hadith apply? Example, <coughs> this is my favorite. Many of you have heard this too many times, but I have to do it in a lecture. Uh, I've done it in a lecture before. Smoking. Smoking cigarettes or shisha or I will not mention the other things, right? Any kind of smoking, tobacco and its brothers and sisters and evil, uh, used to be among the doubtful matters because they were not sure whether the evidences we had were in fact applicable to this, uh, to this smoking thing, right? Does it apply? We had narrations of do not kill yourselves, right? We had the narrations وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمْ طَيِّبَاتِ عَلَيْهِمْ الْخَبَائِبِ When Allah described the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He said, He makes lawful for them all that which is good. And he makes yuharim. What does yuharim mean? From what word? Haram. He prohibits upon them everything which is evil. So at some point in time, before the studies were made on nicotine and the cigarette and the chemicals that it contains, it was actually a doubtful matter. Do the narrations or, and the verses dealing with killing yourself and this is being khabitha, are they applicable to smoking or not? So even though it was doubtful at some point in time, back when it first came out in the Turkish, you know, among the Turks, and then it started spreading among the Muslim Ummah, <coughs> this is no longer the case today. Smoking has been taken out from the level, or from the column of doubtful things into the column of what? Haram. And anyone who doubts that needs to reconsider his position. It is haram beyond any shadow of doubt. How can you say that smoking is not haram? How? If we were to look at it from a number of aspects, because we need to remove this doubt. It's a doubtful matter and we need to remove it and take it from between halal and haram into haram. So no one who smokes here <coughs> or no one who knows anyone who smokes will ever entertain this act of smoking, whether for yourself or for your loved ones, maybe a, a sister, her husband uh, uh, smokes, or her parents smoke, or whatever, right? Smoking needs to be out of our lives as Muslims who believe in Allah and the last day because of the following. Reason number one, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly stated, and this is the strongest evidence that indicates prohibition, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was to make things which are good halal, and things which are evil, haram. And no sound human being, if he were given the option to categorize cigarette under one of two columns, halal, you know, good or evil, no sound human being, even a child, will put the cigarette under the, the column of good things. Because it, it doesn't make sense whether <coughs> you make the studies or you don't. We have the, the, the element of, of the, the smell, you know, imagine someone smelling like an ashtray. Have you smelled an ashtray before? It stinks, right? Someone next to you is smelling like an ashtray. His breath smells like an ashtray. This is, this is repulsive.